Hello, everyone. Thank you for checking out this special episode of Really Dicey. This is Manny, and I'm here with... Graham Davis. I'm probably best known for Warhammer Fantasy Roleplay, and I'm also a director of a new indie tabletop RPG studio called Rookery Publications. But I'm here now to talk about Vesson, Mythic Britain, and Ireland. Exactly. And I'm really excited for this book. The first book was, uh, was a, it's wonderful. Before we get into deep about this new book, uh, let's talk about the first book a little bit. Um, what would, for anyone that's looking at this book, at these books for the first time, what would you say Vesson, Vesson is different um, from like other uh, horror role-playing games like uh, Call of Cthulhu and so on? Right. Um, well, Call of Cthulhu, of course, is tied to the Cthulhu mythos. And um, Vesson is based in European folklore. So it's more folk horror. We've seen a wave of that kind of coming up in the zeitgeist, starting with the Nicolas Cage remake of The Wicker Man. And uh, there are various other films and uh, TV shows and, uh, and even games coming up uh, that are based on folklore and folk horror. Vesson, um, from my point of view, it's kind of a light on the horror. It's more investigative. Um, but you can play it any way you want, and I'm sure some people play it as pure horror. It's set in the uh, mid to late 19th century, so kind of the golden age of, uh, of horror, if you remember the old Hammer and Universal movies, so many of them were set in that period. And uh, the initial book um, was actually based on an art book by a Swedish artist called Jan Egerkrantz. Um, and his style really pervades the, the whole game. Uh, Free League, the Swedish publisher, de developed the game around his art. And I had the, the great opportunity to work with him on the Britain and Ireland book as well. How did you become acquainted with the project? Well, uh, first I saw Vesson itself and I thought, that's really cool. Um, hmm. It's set in what they call the mythic north, which is basically Scandinavia. And uh, I thought, well, we really should have a Britain and Ireland supplement for this. Uh, I've been since probably I was 17 years old and looking for uh, for new monsters to throw at my D&D &D players. I got into folklore that way. And then I went on to study archaeology at college and uh, learn about some of the, the myths and folklore surrounding sites like Stonehenge and Hadrian's Wall and what have you. Um, so in many ways, this is a game I've been wanting to do for decades. Um, I got the chance to do GURPS Fairy back in, I think it was 2003. Hmm. Um, but it, it wasn't quite the game I wanted. And then I saw Vesson. And this was exactly the game I'd had in my mind for so many years, except it was set in Scandinavia. So I wrote to Free League and I said, uh, I really want to do a Britain and Ireland source book for this. And they let me. Oh, that, that's great. Um, and, and, and if I ask, and this is more of a, more of a personal question for myself, because I've been following your work for, for many years. And I know a lot of uh, your friends are the same. And so with, with something like this, how do you keep reinventing yourself I don't know if I'm asking it the right way so how, how do you like everything you've come out is just seems uh, 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 it never feels like a like a, a sequel like a like it feels like it feels like a fresh new product you know I feel like you reinvent horror every time you or reinvent adventure every time you write something out something that comes out um, what if I may ask, uh, what for this project, uh, did you do anything different? Did you have to do uh, different research? Uh, how did you challenge yourself? Um, well, firstly, thank you for that. That's very kind of you. I, I try to honestly just be, be led by the material and the tone of, you know, every game has a different tone. Uh, every game, everything I work on, I'm fortunate being in the position that I can don't have to work on anything that doesn't really interest me, which is really nice. Um, so, uh, you know, just leaning into the things that interest me about a particular game and a particular product, um, that automatically gives it a different kind of flavor. Um, uh, for Vesson, uh, obviously, I had to get to 
very familiar with the core rule book in particular, uh, not just the rule set, but the way they presented information. They structure adventures a particular way. There's obviously a particular way they structure the uh, information on individual creatures. And um, I also paid great attention to the, uh, the set of chapters they had introducing their setting, the Mythic North. Um, so I made sure that I, I mirrored those uh, for Mythic Britain and Ireland so that uh, it would feel like a Vesson product and that people who are familiar with the core rulebook would be able to find their way around as easily as possible. Hmm. So for anyone that's discovering Mythic Britain for the first time, uh, right. how, how would you describe it exactly? What makes the, the, the myths of, of Britain different from maybe myths of different other parts of, of the world? Um, well, there's a lot of overlap, particularly with Scandinavia, because, of course, the Vikings ruled um, a whole portion of the British Isles for quite some time. Um, but then there's the Celtic input, there's the uh, the later fairy lore and what have you. Um, so uh, there's, there are some really unique creatures. I mean, my favorite and the one I talk about most probably is called the Nukalavi which is a, a kind of a demonic centaur sort of creature. Um, accounts vary. In some reports, it's actually a centaur. In others, it's uh, a horse and rider, but a single being, like kind of fused together. Um, and it has a plague breath. It has no skin. It has black blood over yellow organs, and it's utterly horrific. Uh, it comes from the Orkney Islands. Um, so there are some really unique things like that. There are um, every culture has its hags and witches and what have you, uh, but uh, there are particular ones in Britain. Um, and of course, there's the whole range of British, Scottish, Welsh, and Irish fairy law, which um, in m much of the world, including North America, has come to to be what fairy law is just because that's been the homeland of so many people who've moved here. Um, so uh, there's an awful lot to go at uh, in, in British and Irish uh, folklore. Um, plus, we've got the classic um, Victorian Britain, uh, 19th century Britain and Ireland setting, you know, which was uh, the world of Sherlock Holmes and Jack the Ripper and uh, all kinds of, of people. Uh, it's been used in horror forever, like I, I alluded to Hammer and Universal um, movies. And it's just an iconic setting where you can blend fact and fiction. Uh, you've got the, uh, the a lot of social tensions, which can be interesting to play with underlying the, uh, the various supernatural encounters, things like uh, industrialization, urban versus rural, um and uh, in places you know in scotland and, and especially in ireland um english versus uh independent minded people of the the country and uh then you know rich and poor as always um there's just an awful lot and it's an iconic setting uh, as i said that i i really enjoyed mm. so I'm sure uh, players of the first book are just uh, just waiting for me to ask, what are the uh, new player options? Is there, um, what would you say are, or what options are now available in this book um, compared to the first one? Um, okay, well, um, I've added a few uh, playable professions. Um, I forget the, the official basin term for them, character classes for want of another word. Um, and uh, I've also um, added uh, a new society, particular to Britain, uh, because the, uh, the Order of Artemis in uh, the core book is founded in Scandinavia and based in Scandinavia. And uh, I've got a new uh, called the Apollonian Society after the ancient Greek vampire hunter Apollonius of Tyana, who was an actual character. Um, and uh, was founded, uh, let me see, it was founded by Elizabeth I, spy master Walsingham with the help of the occultist John Dee. I've given it all this, this lovely history. And uh, so you have your own support organization and headquarters in London, just as you do in, in Uppsala in the uh, original book. 
Um, as far as as crunchy rules heavy player options go, I've I've kind of stayed away from that um, because honestly the, there wasn't much needed uh, in the, uh, the the Vesson rule book. Everything almost everything from there will translate uh, to Britain and Ireland. Um, there are a couple of, of, of professions I like to put in. I, I did a, a prize fighter, for example, um, be a nice sort of character. But um, mainly I wanted to focus on the creatures. And uh, originally, I think there were 10 new creatures in the book. But uh, with the expansion, the Kickstarter stretch goals, we were able to put a few more in. And I can't quite remember exactly how many there are now. But uh, that was the that and the setting itself were the main expansions. How closely did you have to work with the artist? How closely, how did you work together for this book? Um, okay, his name's Johann Egerkrantz, and um, he's the nicest guy you could ever wish to meet. And I got to work with him fairly closely over as closely as email permitted. Um, I sent him my initial list of, uh, I think it was about 20 or 25 creatures. And we discussed them all and came to an agreement about which ones offered the better, best combination of cool gameplay from my point of view, plus uh, potential to make a really nice picture from his point of view. And uh, so we, uh, we agreed on those. And uh, yeah, it, uh, I, sometimes I had to make a couple of little tweaks because of a way he'd drawn something. He'd picked up one aspect of a creature, which I not emphasized in the rules because he's very, very uh, well up on folklore, not just the, his native Swedish folklore, but uh, we talked about the creatures of mythic Britain and Ireland. And I don't think I stumped him once. He knew about every creature I named. It's very impressive. Um, and it was, uh, yeah, he, he was just a dream to work with. And I hope I get to do that again. Oh, okay. Okay. So uh, when it came to the, to the setting, um, uh, how, what can people expect when they open the book? Uh, is, does it, how, how deep does it go when it comes to the, the history, the, the economy and so forth? Um, well, I tried to make it go as deep as it needed to, to present the, the, the 19th century setting. You know, I, I, uh, I alluded to a little bit of history going back to like Tudor times, uh, the 1600s. Um, but I didn't go too heavy on that because I wanted to make every word in the book useful to the player and the GM um, immediately. And uh, uh, a lecture about, you know, two or three hundred years of intervening history was uh, of limited usefulness. And we had only so many pages. Um, but I did go into quite a lot of detail about society and culture, the the various um, tensions and lines of fracture in society that I, I mentioned, um, and even practical things like the way pre-decimal British coinage worked, mm. you know, pounds and shillings and pence and, uh, and so on. Um, and, um, yeah, because the... Um, because the 19th century Britain setting has been used so much uh, in film and TV and books and stuff, it's kind of a lot of been glossed over and romanticized and everybody thinks they're, they're sort of going to dance with Mary Poppins or something or solve mysteries with Sherlock Holmes. And uh, there's a lot going on in society at that time. Uh, you know, with the uh, industrialization, class strife, colonialism, uh, independence movements in Ireland and Scotland and Wales, um, the British being horrible to just about everybody, the English, that is to say. And um, so I wanted to make sure also the, the darker side of, of like Charles Dickens with the, uh, the urban poor being mistreated and exploited, that sort of thing. And I wanted to make sure all of that was covered. Um, and people can take and, you know, use what they like and leave the rest. It's up to the, the GM to uh, set the tone for their campaign. But I wanted everybody to have all the information to do it whatever way they wanted. Hmm. Okay. So one last question. If I was running uh, this game, um, mm -hmm. and you were one of my players, who would you be? Yeah. Who would you, uh, 
Who would you try to uh, be to survive in this setting? Oh, that is a good one. Um, well, I'm tempted to say someone scholarly, like a, a folklorist or even some kind of he um, hedge magician to kind of give me a leg up on understanding what's going on. Um, but I think I would probably want to be a, a, a Sherlock Holmes type detective character who had a good array of investigative skills, was able to stay calm under pressure and could figure stuff out. Hmm. Oh, excellent, excellent. Well, this will be out in October, right? At least a printed version? Uh, yes, the uh, the Kickstarter backers are receiving their physical books even as we speak. Um, Pre-orders are open for the uh, the general sale, and that means you can get the PDF right away if you pre-order or if you just order the PDF. And uh, latest information that I've seen is that the physical book will be available from October the 11th. Excellent, excellent. Well, uh, thank you, sir, for taking the time to talk to us about this. Um, uh, once I heard you were involved with it, I was like, oh, this is going to be really good. And, um, okay, and, thank you. And I'm, I'm pleased to hear that it's going to be beyond what I expected. And I'm so happy about that. Um, so, so viewers out there, uh, thank you very much uh, for watching. Yeah. Stay safe out there and we'll see you soon.